happens. <clears throat> okay, well, once again, happy Sabbath and happy new year. <clears throat> it's uh, hard to believe that we're actually beginning a new year. <clears throat> I uh, look at the, at the date 2023. First of all, I have to learn how to write a new date, 23. You know, that's a challenge. <clears throat> and then I think to myself, you know, it's only just a couple weeks ago, maybe a year or two ago, that we were dealing with Y2K. Do you remember that? Y2K. My goodness, I never could have imagined thinking ahead to 2023. And yet here we are, 2023. Well, God has blessed us this past year, and um, it's exciting to think about what God might have in store for you and for us as a group in this new year. It's hard to believe what we see happening in the world. It becomes increasingly a chaotic world, but it's also a, a relief to know that Above and beyond and behind everything, there is a God who is in control. And for that, we can be very, very thankful. I just realized that my... Oh, dear. we got a problem here. All right. Well, let's uh, begin uh, our Sabbath school and let's begin our new year with prayer. And then we'll go into our Sabbath school lesson. Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you that you are our creator. You are the one who has sustained us in the past. And you are the one who will sustain us as we move into a new year. We ask that as we begin this year, that you would please bless us. Please protect us. Please help us to know the way that we should go as we are faced with challenges. We thank you that you have given us the opportunity on a weekly basis to come and to worship you and to be blessed by you. We ask that your Holy Spirit would be present, not only today, but in the lives of each of us on a daily basis as we live our lives for you. As we begin this new quarter, we ask that you would Help us to understand the principles by which you would have us live. We thank you now for hearing and for answering this prayer. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, first uh, question of the day is, does everybody have a quarterly? Maybe not necessarily with you, but do you have access to one? If you don't, then you need to let us know so that we can get you a quarterly so that you can study along uh, throughout the week and be um, and participate in the discussions that we have here Sabbath by Sabbath. We are beginning a new quarter and this quarter is titled Managing for the Master Till He Comes. So I want to ask you a question. What does the word managing mean? Managing. I'm sorry, Jim? Taking care of. Any other ideas? Any other thoughts? I'm sorry? Protect. Okay, yes. Jim, I think Jim kind of nailed it right on the head. Right. Taking care of things. Taking care of things. Okay, managing for the master. The master, of course, is who? Our creator God, exactly. <clears throat> and apparently our job description has a time limit on it. Notice that? Till he comes. Okay, till he comes. Now I don't necessarily think that that means that after that it's just all beach time. I suspect there will be things that we will have responsibilities for, or at least have the opportunity to be responsible for. But at least for the moment, this is where we are, this is the situation that we're in, and we're here for a reason. God wants us to be doing something on his behalf, 
in relationship to the things that he's created. So that is the focus that we're going to be looking at as we move into this new quarter. Now, this first week, lesson one, is focusing on something that I sort of didn't anticipate, but I think it's a good place to start. And this lesson is entitled, Part of God's Family. Part of God's family. Let me ask you a question. What does the word family mean to you? And before you answer that question, I want to frame it within this context. And that is, is that I suspect that that word means something different to every person in this room. We have just come through the holiday season, the Christmas season. And I believe Thanksgiving and Christmas are the two times of the year when family is considered the most important focus. People will travel from Florida to Washington to be with family. But there are also people who will stay in Florida to be as far away from family as they can be. So what does the word family mean? People who are related to each other, okay? In different ways, okay. All interconnected, okay, what else? Church family, okay. So uh, it's interesting, uh, there is the family, my parents, my brothers, my sisters, but then there's the family that we can actually create outside of that. And as I look back over my life, there are individuals who have become family who are not family, but nevertheless are family. Okay. So, <clears throat> yes, through faith, through relationships, all kinds of things. Yes, exactly. Uh, I've had the opportunity of traveling around the world as a child growing up, and it's amazing. You fly into a country you've never been in, your, in, in before in your life. There are, you're, you find yourself meeting people you've never seen before, and yet they seem like family because of the common faith and because of the backgrounds and things like that that seem to sort of connect us. Yes, Kelly. Kelly. Yeah, they're your family. That, that's exactly right. Okay. So, here, so, so that's, the, that's the context within, you know, we look at family in terms of our day-to-day -day experience. But now we're talking about part of God's family. And um, let's look at the memory text, which is for today. This is 1 John 3, verse 1. It says, See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. And then as if that's not enough, what does he say? And so we are. Now, what is John talking about when he says this? What is he saying here? We shall be called children of God and so we are. What is he talking about here? And there's more than one answer to this question, by the way. What is, God what is John talking about here? We're adopted, okay. I'll give you a point. Anybody else? Oh, I'm sorry? What is the question? Okay. Um, 
What is John talking about when he uses the phrase, we are called the children of God and so we are? And I'm saying there's more than one way of looking at this answer, the answer to that question. Okay, that's the starting point. We're children of God from the sense that we were all created by God. Okay, I'll give you a point. But let me ask you a question. Is that what John is talking about here? Okay, Kelly, I'll give you a point, but that's too, too nebulous. It doesn't, it's not, not specific. I believe that what John is talking about here is what somebody has said already a couple of times, or a couple of you have already said, and that is the family of God, in many sense, is in terms of the, the common faith that we have in relationship to what God has done for us. Kathy, yes. Okay. Okay. Yes, exactly. Okay, well, let's continue on. Um, we're now going to look at Sunday, and this gives us a number of texts. And here we have the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 4 excuse me, Ephesians 3, 14 and 15, making this statement. For this reason, Paul is speaking here, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. What is the context that Paul is talking about here when he speaks of bowing before God the Father, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Okay. Why is he bowing in to God the Father? Ron, could you repeat what you said earlier? Exactly. I believe what Paul is talking about here is he's talking about, he's acknowledging the fact that we are all created by God the Father, by, by, by God the Creator, let's put it that way. I'm sorry, what's that? Okay. Um, now, Families. How many of you chose the family that you were born into? We choose our friends, but not our family. Oh, that's an interesting way. Yes. None of us had anything to do with the family that we were born into. I don't know why. Oh, let's see, how do I say this? It is a sobering thing let's see I'm still struggling trying to see how to say this. Have you I'll speak for myself. I don't know why I was blessed to be born into the family that I was born. In the place that I was born. In the country that I was born. In the time that I was born. Yes. Um, you know, I have two pictures up here on the screen. Um, my experience would have been what you see on the left. Why me? Why was I 
privileged. And, and I use that word very intentionally. Why was I privileged to be born into a loving family, stable family? I never had to worry about food. I never was concerned about whether I was going to have a blanket over me at night. It's going to have a bath, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And yet, the world is full of people, children, on the right, who have literally nothing. They survive by their wits end, and many of them don't survive. <clears throat> oh, of course, absolutely. Um, and you know, I, we could have been him, absolutely, or her. Yeah. yeah. Um, now, we had no choice in the family that we are born into, but do we have a choice in the family that we live in? And I bring this up because I want to transition from, you know, the, the, the biological family to the spiritual family. All right? And I ask you this question. Um, we, we, we started this lesson by looking at God as being our creator overall. Okay? Okay? And that is true. But let me ask you a question. How many families are there really in the world today? It's a trick question here because you can go down this a number of ways. There's actually two families in the world today. All right? And there are two fathers in the world today. One of those is God the Father, who ultimately has created everyone, all of us. Okay. But nevertheless, he is also the one who is the father of a very large and active family on this earth. But there is also a counterfather. And that is who? Satan the deceiver. All right? So the point that I want you to think about here is, is that while we had no choice in terms of which biological family we were born into, do we have a choice in terms of which spiritual family we exist in. And I believe the answer is yes. Exactly. We can either be in God's family on the left, or we can be in the family of Satan the deceiver. We hear about people who have never heard the name of Jesus. Yes, that's true. So there are people who've never heard the name of Jesus, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're not aware of overarching principles of good and bad. You know, it's interesting. You can travel around the world. You can go to very primitive locations. And even among those people who don't read, write, have no vocabulary, no alphabet, they have no et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, whatever list you want to have, they have a sense of right and wrong. They understand that you don't kill somebody. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't cultures where killing has been, you might say, elevated in a, in a very negative way. But they have a sense of right and wrong. 
And how that all happens and how God works through that, I don't know. But the good news is, he is drawing all people into his family if they will respond. Okay, so let's continue on. Now, one of the verses is John 20, verse 17. And I want you to look at this verse. This is after Jesus has been raised from the dead, and there is uh, a significant amount of confusion and shock and grief and chaos as to what has happened at the tomb. And Mary is at the tomb. Others have been there. They've left. And now Jesus appears to Mary, and he says the following to her. Jesus said to Mary, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers, referring to the disciples, and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and to your God. What was Jesus communicating to them there? I believe he was, he was trying to help Mary and the disciples to begin to transition from an old view of the kind of person God was to a different view. And I believe that that... that I believe that at the cross and at, at the resurrection, God, God did not change. But what did change was the opportunity for us to relate to God in a way that had not been possible up until that point in time. Was, was God the Father, Jesus' Father? As, per, as demonstrated, as, as communicated to us, that's the way they have presented themselves to us, okay? But Jesus was now wanting us to view him in a, in a much more expansive way. He wanted us to look at him the same way as he had looked himself to God. Now, earlier than that, I believe God had given some, or Jesus had given some indications as to where we were going with this, okay? And that's the Lord's Prayer, okay? And how does the Lord's Prayer begin? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Now, let me ask you a question. What's the most important word in that phrase? Our. What does that mean? What does that, in, what does that imply? We are part of what? Exactly. And so when Jesus uses the word our father, he is including everybody present, the disciples there, and anything that Jesus has access to God the Father from, He's now expanding that to you and I also. Good news or bad news? Good news. I agree. Ellen White makes a statement in Desire of Ages. The family of heaven and the family of earth are the same. One. Thank you. Exactly. Okay, so, as members of a family, what do you have access to? Let's see, is that the right way I want to say that? Um, as members of a family, um, uh, let's see, let's start over. In old times, 
Who owned everything in a family? The father. The oldest son would inherit the, what the, the, son, the father had. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, let's see. Did I just miss something here? I just... Uh, I should also close and mention here Galatians 3, 26 through 29. <clears throat> uh, okay, this, this is also an important point that I think we need to keep in mind. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons, and I'm going to put in here daughters of God, through faith. For as many as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male or female, for you are all one in Christ. And if you are Christ... Then you are what? Abraham's offsprings and heirs according to the promise. Okay, so tell me. Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. What was promised to Abraham? And what do we have access to as a result that we are heirs of the promise? What was the promise? All families were to be blessed through Abraham. Okay. Um, can you expand on that, George? Um, what, was the, what was the blessing that God wanted to extend through Abraham that we would all benefit from? I'm sorry, you laid it back. Eternal life. Eternal life? Okay, I'll give you half a point. Yes. The land. The land? Okay, I'll give you half a point. What was the promise that God was make, making through Abraham? What was the... Great nation. Great nation? I'll give you half a point. <laughs> Come on, you guys. What's that? Salvation. Salvation, okay. Who was going to come through the lineage of Abraham? Jesus Christ. That's exactly right. I mean, that's the only way salvation is, 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 was going to become a possibility for you and I. Was if Jesus came, if Jesus lived, if Jesus died, and if Jesus what? Right. Well, before you said it, he had to raise from the dead. Okay. Once he had raised from the dead, it was over. The, the battle was won. Okay. And as a result of Jesus... What was the promise then that we would experience? We would, some of you already said that we would experience the opportunity to restore back to what we had lost. To be part of a great nation. Okay, now the great nation comes in, and the great nation is not necessarily the to Abraham, but to whom? David. The entire universe. It was not Israel. Correct. Okay, yes. He came down to our level because we couldn't get up to his. Okay, yes, he came down to help bring us up to him. Absolutely. Okay, so the fact that we are part of God's family, spiritual God's family, is the result of what? It is through Jesus Christ. Through faith, yes, absolutely, through faith. It is through Jesus Christ by faith. And how do you become a member of this family? You can choose to be in that family. You get to choose which family you are a member of. Is that good news? Okay. All right, um, let's fly through a few things here. God is the owner of everything. Uh, we won't spend much time talking about David and what he did in terms of putting together all the supplies and things that Solomon needed to build the temple. But um, let's look at what he says in 1 Chronicles 29, 13 through 14. David asked the question, but who am I and what is it my people that we should be able thus to offer willingly for all things come from you 
and of your own have we given you. What is David saying here? They had gathered all this, inform all this material to build a temple. Massive amount of wealth. And as David is giving this, handing this over to Solomon, he makes this statement, for all things come from you and of your own have we given you. What is he acknowledging here? Everything is God's to begin with. And of course, why, do we, why, why does he have ownership of everything? Because he created it in the first place. Okay. Uh, Psalms 50, 10 through 12. Every beast, every cattle, every bird, everything that moves in the field is mine. If I am hungry, I would not tell you, for the world and its fullness are mine. What is David saying here? Everything is God's. That's exactly right. Everything. All right. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yes, very interesting, isn't it? Okay, now, <clears throat> because God owns everything, because we have the ability to choose to be in God's family, that means what? That the resources that God has are available to his family members. Whose car was the first car that you asked to drive? <laughs> That's right. Exactly. Okay. Sometimes I didn't always take care of my dad's things the way I should have. Okay. I had to learn some lessons there. But it's, it's, within, it's within the family and the resources of the family that as family members, we reach out for, for access. Okay. <clears throat> so on Tuesday, there's some verses uh, Psalms 23, 1, the Lord is my shepherd. We're all familiar with, with that uh, psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. And what's the next the phrase? I shall not want. Why should we not want? Why shall we not want? Right. Because he promised to provide. Okay. So, uh, Philippians 4, verse 19, which is a, a classic and my God, Paul speaking here, says, will what? Supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Okay. Now, with being a member of the family and with having access to resources in the family, what does that mean? imply responsibility let me ask you a question what does it mean to be responsible it's an unknown okay how okay how you talk and how you walk okay um, how many of you have ever had somebody say to you somebody well no, let's rephrase this. How many of you have had your father say to you, or your mother say to you, son or daughter, remember who, what your last name is? Okay. What is that person saying? You represent the family in a situation. Conduct yourself accordingly. Okay. So responsibility. Now, responsibility implies that you have... Okay, yes, you do have choices. Thank you, Jim. Uh, you have choices. You can choose how you're going to represent. Okay. Um, we shouldn't play the part of the prodigal son. Okay, I like that also. I'll give you a point. Deuteronomy and Matthew both 
say basically the same thing in relationship to responsibilities of God's family. <clears throat> Deuteronomy, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Matthew 22, verse 37, which is what Jesus spoke to the young, rich young ruler. And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. What does that imply? Uh, let's look at Deuteronomy 10, verses 12 through 13, and let's look at some key words here. God is now speaking to Israel, and it says, Now Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep the commandments and statutes of the Lord, which I am commanding you today, for your good. What does it mean to fear? Respect. Respect. Okay. What does it mean to walk? Action. Is it better to walk or to talk? Walk. walk. I'll give Jeannie a point there. <laughs> okay. What does it mean to love? Do okay again. Actions speak louder than words. Okay, to serve. Be willing to not be number one. Okay, I'll give you a point there. Yes. Okay. Um, to me, what this is saying here is, is that God may sometimes ask us to do things. That may be a little bit outside of our comfort zone. Maybe things that we aren't too interested in doing. But nevertheless, God said, I have a job for you to do. Sure, I'm ready to do it. You want me to do that? Wait a minute. That wasn't on my list. Let somebody else do it. No, God says, this is for you. And in fact, it is to help you. Okay. Um, when you say serve implies that I'm not in charge. Serve, I like that very much. Serve implies that I am not in charge. Mm -hmm. Verse 13. Keep the commandments and the statutes of God. What is keeping me? Obey. Okay. I'm sorry? In line with? Okay. And then the last three words. The last three words of this statement. What is it? For your for your good. Trust. Learn to trust. Yes. Now let me ask you a question. How many of you can think of something that your parents have asked you to do or required of you or told you to do, which at the time you weren't very happy about it. <laughs> Brushing your teeth, okay. <laughs> Brushing your teeth, okay. But which in time you come to recognize was spot on exactly what you needed. Brushing your teeth. Brushing your teeth, okay. Okay. For your good. 1 John 5, 3 says, For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. Let me ask you a question. What is the significance of not burdensome mean? Not hard. Okay. Not very hard to do. Oh. Some, oh, my, sometimes it has been very hard for me to do things that I've been asked to do. But at the end of the day, God never leads his children in a way other than they would choose to be led if they could see the end from the beginning. I would suggest you can have peace 
in your heart at the end of the day, even if there are challenges, if you're doing it with God's help. So you can have peace in your heart at the end of the day, even though you have challenges during the course of the day, to accomplish what God has asked you to do. Okay. Didn't, didn't I read in the Bible that God said there's stuff that we can, can do that he won't have? God will ask us to do what we more than we're able to? Yeah. Yes. Right. Is that a good, is that good news? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Well, on the back slide before this, yes. you know, you the four you are good. Four you are good. Okay. Uh, somebody suggested it was indicative of faith. I see that as a promise. A promise, okay, yes. It's a promise. And his commandments are not burdensome. That's a promise. And they're statements of reality that sometimes, well, we are told we are to have the mind of Christ. We have to allow our thinking, our way of thinking, to be the same as his. And if he says the commandments, these things are for our good, and that they're not burdensome. Yes. If we would simply internalize that in our own philosophy, it's easier to to act it out, yes. and, and they become we become what we think. So I, I agree with everything you said. The one thing I would say that if we use the word simply, it's not always a simple process. Sometimes it takes time. Sometimes the school of hard knocks has to experience yep. in order for us to actually learn that. Okay, so I want to move right on then here to the issue of treasures in heaven. And I want to ask you a question. Is it ever possible? Is that right? Is it ever possible that you could have too much money? Yes. <laughs> Love. 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 Yeah. <laughs> Say that again, please. No. The, the lady back here in the middle said, no. I keep wondering about the dinosaurs. He made the dinosaurs. Yeah, we'll, we'll figure that one out when we get to have it. We'll learn about that answer. We don't know the answer to that. Okay, so the point that I want you to think about in relationship to this, um, uh, let's see, Wednesday, Thursday, treasures in heaven. Your prayer should be that God will give you as much money as, you can as he help. possibly can. Mm -hmm. But as Richard said, God never gives us more than we can handle. 
And so the focus of your resources should be what can you do with it? Because I believe that what God wants us to do with the resources that he gives us is to use it in ways to help other people. All right? The lesson has this statement here. <clears throat> Money has great value because it can do what? Great good. Great good. So then the question is, So what good are you making happen with the money that God has given you? Now, the answer to that question, I believe, is different for every person in this room. Why do I say that? Say that? Not everybody has the same amount. Oh, Kathy, I'm not going to give you even half a point for that. Nothing? It has nothing to do with the amount of money that you have. Our willingness to use it's, what God has given us. It's, it's, it's where you are interacting with society. It's where you are interacting with people. It's where you have the opportunity to see needs and you decide that you are going to use the resources that God has given you to meet a need. <clears throat> and that need isn't just everybody else. The first need is to care for our own. Yes, 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 yes. I, I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not a subject. Yes, okay, yes, George. Sure. Uh, the first time I wrote out a check for time, yes. I really didn't really want to. And, and if God would have spoken to me, out, he said, put it back in your pocket. You really don't love me. And uh, until we are in a, a certain stage in life, uh, God's commandments are burdensome. It's when we grow into a certain stage, and the, and the same thing with, with our treasures. Yes, I, 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 so I, I think what I, what I hear you say is, is that as, as, we, as we're willing to use what God has given us and to learn as we go along, God helps us grow in our ability to trust Him and to and, and to recognize needs and to know how to respond to those needs and to fit and fill those needs. My, my challenge to you is <clears throat> as members of God's family, the one who owns everything, the one to, who has promised to meet our needs, when it comes to managing for the master, the one who has created us. Think outside the box in terms of the resources that God has given you and how you help other people. And the most interesting way of doing that is if they never know where it came from. Money has great value because it can do great good. But money can do no good if it is not put to Yes, thank you, sir. That's a very, very important point.
the resources that God has given you, that is what we're talking about within the, con the under the definition of money. Yes, you're absolutely right. So, I hope that this has given you some ideas in terms of where we're going in this quarter. Let us pray as we close this out. <clears throat> Father in heaven, every one of us in this room is a wealthy person. You have blessed us with knowledge, with skills, with tools, and even with money. And I pray that as we go about this coming week, that you will help us recognize opportunities where we can use what you have entrusted to us to help other people. Please forgive us for where we failed in the past, and we look forward to growing in the future as we move forward. Thank you, Father, for your love, your care, your watchkeeping, and for blessing us this Sabbath, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.